Hello, and welcome back to Missouri Civil War. Today we consider the social costs of the war in the state. We look at the way that civilians coped with the problem of refugees, especially those uh, who poured into St. Louis seeking safety and refuge. Our main focus will be the Western Sanitary Commission and its efforts to help these folks. That commission became the most important relief agency, not just in St. Louis, but in all of Missouri, and perhaps of the entire Mississippi Valley. We'll conclude with the commission's great fundraising effort, the 1864 Fair, which became one of the most successful charitable events of the entire war. Let's pick up where we left off last week with the widespread devastation that resulted from years of, civil, of guerrilla warfare. We focused on the violence along the Missouri-Kansas line, but that was hardly uh, the only part of the state to be affected. Lizzie Brannock wrote, Our country is desolate, indeed almost entirely a wilderness. Robbery is an everyday affair, so long as there was anything to take from our farms. Our farms are all burned up, fences gone, crops destroyed. No one escapes the ravages, one party or the other. Whether driven away by Union forces or pro-Confederate guerrillas, the refugees forced from their homes suffered great economic losses. Selling property at anything close to pre-war values was impossible, and most could only hope that someday they could return to find that anything was left. Travel was dangerous. Moving through occupied parts of Missouri required securing a pass from Union officials. And then imagine people, most of them elderly or women, children, the disabled, um, traveling with the few possessions they could manage uh, and being attacked by armed bands. It was a, a very difficult plight indeed. Refugees were largely left upon their own. In some places, Union authorities did allow officers to provide aid to these destitute masses. Uh, part of this assistance was related to the recruitment of African American uh, military volunteers. As black men volunteered to fight, their wives and children joined the number of refugees outside of these military posts. They argued that their husband's military service obligated the army to help. Uh, and so refugees would receive food and shelter, but these military rations were hardly enough to meet the magnitude of this problem. In many cases, local officers tried to push the refugees elsewhere. In the midst of the guerrilla war, some Missourians were not eager to lend a hand. People in Clay and Platte counties, for instance, made it known that the refugees exiled by Order No. 11 were not welcome. This reluctance was partly practical because many people lacked the resources to help, even if they, they were women and children and the elderly. This reluctance was also partly strategic and political to offer aid to such exiles might mark one as a Southern sympathizer and thus draw the ire of Union authorities. This massive displacement of civilians foreshadowed hardships that would be visited upon much of the Deep South in the final years of the Civil War. Eventually, the federal government created an ambitious new agency, the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, to deal with this crisis. Yet that wouldn't come until 1865. A variety of groups thus emerged to confront the social costs of war. The Western Sanitary Commission became the most important charity dispensing group in Missouri. Its relief efforts extended to the refugee population, but so much more. The commission was founded in September 1861 by General John C. Fremont. It was modeled after the United States Sanitary Commission, but there were important differences between the two groups. The USSC would focus largely upon conditions in the East, and it received federal funds. The WSC did not, and it became, out of necessity, focused on the West. The Western Sanitary Commission was created at the behest of Reverend William Greenleaf Elliott, a Unitarian minister and the founder of St. Louis's Washington University. The commission initially focused upon the care of wounded soldiers, particularly after the Battle of Wilson's Creek. During the winter of 1861 and 1862, the group helped to equip railroad cars to move wounded troops from the battlefield to the general military hospitals in St. Louis. By war's end, the commission had funded more than 70 hospitals west of the Mississippi, and it ran 15 of them in St. Louis alone. 
In addition to improving medical care, both in urban hospitals and in the field, the Commission also provided soldiers' homes to men on leave and those who could not afford room and board in local hotels. In some respects, it was akin to the modern USO, providing many kinds of comfort to U.S. troops. As its name suggests, the organization also worked to improve conditions in St. Louis prisons, which, as I've said before, were pretty awful in some cases. Under the leadership of James Yateman, the Western Sanitary Commission coordinated the work of several benevolent associations in St. Louis. One of the groups that aided the commission was the Ladies' Union Aid Society, which worked to help injured and sick soldiers. This women's group was part of a national network of auxiliaries in which women raised money and provided all manner of goods, socks, mittens, blankets, and so on, to help the war effort. Women also played an important part in the burials and memorials of Civil War dead. This would become an important form of public leadership that women, that women assumed in the post-war era. By the summer of 1863, the Western Sanitary Commission was also transporting African-American refugees from southern camps into the city. Once there, refugees, black and white, received cash, food, clothing, and shelter. The following year, the Commission established a Freedmen's Orphans Home, which the Ladies' Society supervised. The groups also assumed some responsibility for schooling black children, and this was part of a larger effort. The American Missionary Association helped to recruit and pay teachers. The Sanitary Commission paid rent for the school buildings, and sometimes for teachers' salaries. And the Union Army often provided housings and rations uh, for people who worked uh, at these schools. Before the war, African American leaders in St. Louis had established a system outside of existing municipal authorities. And in fact, because of an 1847 state law and a city ordinance that prohibited, from te prohibited the teaching of black children, this system rested entirely upon African American citizens' shoulders. Hiram Revels taught the largest school for black pupils in St. Louis. Revels had come to the city and received ordination as a minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. After the war, he moved to Mississippi, and he became the first African American elected to the U.S. Senate. To pay for its various causes, the Western Sanitary Commission turned to a successful tradition of sanitary fairs. Through the antebellum North, these fairs had been a common way for charities to raise funds. The Western Commission organized its great fair, dubbed the Mississippi Valley Sanitary Fair, for the spring of 1864. This event, like other wartime fairs, served many purposes. First, it provided people with a psychological diversion and helped to restore morale. After three years of war, this was an important function. Americans had suffered a staggering loss of life. There was palpable resentment about the draft as sons of wealthy families seemed more able to escape service. In addition, by this point, many civilian relief groups were nearly broke, and the fair promised to raise a substantial amount of money. Third, the fairs would also help to educate the public and to allay fears about misspent funds. Finally, the fair might help to recruit badly needed volunteers. By all accounts, the 1864 Mississippi Valley Sanitary Fair was a spectacle. Its attractions included an art gallery, a grotto and fountain, a Delphic oracle fortune teller. There were livestock displays, patriotic music performances, technological and natural curiosities, and a robust auction and general sale. In attendance were Missouri's Unionist governor and officials from several Midwestern states. There had been some controversy before the fair about whether to allow native wines and beer from Missouri. Many of St. Louis's immigrants, including its sizable German population, supported alcohol sales. But the city's Protestant clergy and temperance leaders thought the fair an inappropriate venue. This reminds us that the social and cultural tensions that had swirled during the 1840s and 1850s, those certainly don't fade away during wartime. In this case, Another Missouri Compromise was reached that allowed the sale of alcohol to go on, but a few blocks away from the actual fair. 
The Mississippi Valley Fair proved a smashing success. It cleared more than half a million dollars. In the aggregate, this hall was smaller than the fairs in New York and Philadelphia, but on a per capita basis, the St. Louis Fair raised $3.50 per person, more than twice as much as its eastern rivals. In conclusion, the Mississippi Valley Sanitary Fair shows us many things. Its popularity reveals how ordinary Americans were eager amid the traumas of the past three years for an escape, if only for a moment. It also illustrates how civilians rallied to support the war effort and to help mitigate the traumas that it brought. Around them, the war dragged on. As major Union victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg back in the summer of 1863 turned the tide of war in the Union's favor, its resolution did not seem imminent. Ulysses Grant, who had started the war in Missouri, was now reassigned to Virginia, and his troops there waged a bloody and protracted offensive against Robert E. Lee's Confederates. In the Deep South, William T. Sherman's Union forces were months away from their crushing march to the sea. And in Missouri, the Union Army continued to hold the state, as it had done tenuously for the better part of two years. 1864, however, renewed rebel hopes for retaking the state. For our next video, we consider how they planned to do so. Until then.